Another episode of Heart Slayers. I'm your host, Derek Acosta, and I'm Meg Turner, and I'm a robot. <laughs> That's right. Or for the people watching at home, you're the invisible Meg Turner. <laughs> the invisible girl, Meg Turner. Meg's <laughs> calling us from home today, everybody, because um, well, why don't you so let them know sick. what's going on? So I have like the worst virus that I've probably ever had. So I'm really, really sick, and I look like a monster. She has the worst virus of all time, so. <laughs> I'm dying, uh, but basically. But she's still being a trooper, calling in from her hospital bed, her deathbed, <laughs> just to give advice to all the people out there who, who need it, so. I I'm think ready. without further ado, let's get it started. Unless there's anything else you want to say, Meg. No, I'm ready. I'm ready to help people. Okay. I know you can't see me right now, but I'm going to keep looking at your chair as if you're here right <laughs> next to me whenever you talk. Perfect. Okay. All right. On with the show. All right, everybody. We're talking to the son of M. Hawk, one of our most, uh, what should we say, loyal fans of Heart Slayer, somebody we always enjoy speaking to. What's happening, M. Hawk? Uh, I'm just chilling here in Alaska. It's uh, probably near freezing outside right now, and I wanted to talk about... I don't know if this happens to other people, but have you ever run into situations where you you're friends with people and then you're friends with you make other friends and when they get together you find out, oh geez, my these people who I'm for both friends with don't have like they there's some sort of friction or like eventually a falling out and you end up caught in the blast zone as it were. I guess that's sort of the like what's the difference between being a fence sitter and not just letting people's petty differences ruin your ability to be friends with them? So uh, your question is, you had a friends group, you made a new group of friends, or maybe this was just one person, but when you brought them together, they didn't really click? Right, things like that, or even sometimes longtime friendships that can uh, have a falling out. An example of this would be, I was friends with a, a couple who had a really messy divorce, and because I didn't take sides in it, that cost me friends in other groups, basically. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Just various scenarios like that. I just end up in this spot, it seems like, frequently where, like, in my effort to make friends with people and then I, then some, so, it, being friends with these people who don't necessarily know each other, they come to meet each other and they have, and then they have friction. And I guess, actually, now I remember, this goes back really far, actually, back to my first relationship where I was going out with this, uh, this one girl and I introduced her to a friend of mine who also happened to be a girl. She didn't have a ride and I was driving around that day. So, and I happened to be going to see my girlfriend at that time. So I'm like, Hey, here, I can introduce you to a friend of mine. And then what ended up happening later, and this ended up being the axis of why I broke up with her was that she had a, because I introduced her to this girl, she had a dream that I was cheating on her with her. <laughs> and yeah. That's another thing. Am, am I wrong for feeling slighted that like just introducing the person I'm going out with to another person I'm friends who I just happen to be friends with who just happens to be of the opposite sex that that immediately like triggers all of their suspicions? That's kind uh, of a this, ridiculous this is, situation. This is this is very broad, and I've already gone past my two <laughs> minutes. So it's okay. I, just I think you discovered uh, my way back to the original. Yourself, M. Hawk. No, that's not normal. <laughs> it's not um, normal at all. I didn't think so. You know, I'm the type of person I like to get along with everybody. I don't like drama. I don't like conflict between my friends. I don't thrive in that sort of situation. But I've definitely known a lot of people who do. People yeah. who only feel comfortable when there's some sort of gossip in their friends group and maybe they even pretend like they don't like it, but you know, secretly they they thrive on that stuff. I find that um, in those situations, somebody is always being dramatic. Uh, maybe both people are being dramatic, but uh, I always try to avoid those people who seem to really like the drama. Um, you know what I mean? It's just not it, worth their time. It's what funny how it just it, it comes about sometimes. 
sometimes it's a it's a misunderstanding and no matter what you do like yeah i, I want to get along with everyone and i end up meddling i think too much sometimes and that's something i've had to learn as i grow older is to kind of just well you can't change you really can't change this even if you try to be as earnest as you can to both people hey here's i think this is the misunderstanding you're having it, sometimes neither only one side may see it and the other won't or neither side will see it yeah, when it comes to your girlfriend being jealous about you having a female friend, uh, that's not a healthy relationship. So that the was that, fact geez, that that goes back like over a decade too. But that was just something that I never really thought about until recently when I thought about the issues I I just seem to have where people I know don't get along with each other, and it almost seems like it all kind of goes back to that. Do you have a situation right now where this is happening? Do you have a group of friends that are not getting along with each other? Uh, this is kind of a fallout from over a year ago, and it's just it's before like the messy breakup I mentioned. Just, just it's just been various coincidental situations that were that where that has occurred. Yeah. Well, maybe it's not a bad idea to try to be fair in the situation to hear out both sides why one group of friends doesn't like the other or why they both dislike each other. Um, and then you can make your decision about what is the group of friends that is going to be healthiest for you moving forward. Does one group of friends not like the other group of friends because they have destructive personality traits? Or is it just some petty little thing that doesn't really matter? Uh, that's the question that I would be asking in that situation. Yeah, and that's usually what what, what I've come to is like, I'll usually I'm usually able to sort of see where it's either just a personality conflict between people or grievances that maybe other people won't address. That's kind of what was what the the divorce between two of my really good friends was about was uh, one of the people in the relationship felt like they were doing most of the heavy lifting. I also don't feel like there's a big problem with having multiple friend group anyway. Right, and they don't always have to intersect. Exactly. Yeah, sometimes you get, you know, freedom from one friend group by going and visiting the other, and mixing them is, you know, not the best thing for you. So maybe just keep them apart and enjoy them both. You know, you get to be the one person who gets to enjoy uh, everybody's company. That makes you actually the most <laughs> popular guy in the social circle, and that's not a pl bad place to be. So there you go. <laughs> Well, yeah. thanks for taking my call. Oh, definitely. Anytime, M Hawk. We're happy to talk to you. And uh, we'll see you later. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. We're back here with J Dog. J Dog has a deep personal life question for us. What's happening, J Dog? What's up? Hey, well, uh, so I'm just having a bit of an internal struggle here. I'm 17. I am in my some of my senior year of high school. I'm homeschooled for this year, uh, specifically so I can work on my portfolio. I'm into film stuff. I'm also trying to save up money so I can move off to uh, Atlanta, Georgia, on my own uh, in a few months. So I'm trying to figure out what's a better use of my time. Uh, should I be working more jobs or? Should I be making more connections via Instagram? I've been reaching out to people and like offering to do free work for them. Uh, and also, I've just been trying to build my personal brand online. So what, what do you think I should prioritize? Wait till I get to Atlanta to start reaching out and building connections or get a head start now and not work as many jobs? It's a good question. So, Is that, do I need you're, a, you're studying. You want to be a filmmaker? Yes. Uh, and sh your question is, should you start making movies now or wait until you... Oh, no, 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 connections, connections and building my personal brand. I'm, I'm working my filmmaker stuff like every day already, but I'm wondering, should I be building my personal like online brand and like, because I've been reaching out to like internet famous people or internet people and offering to do free work for them to like get my name out there. But should I just wait to do that and focus on gaining money now? Does that make does that make sense? Yeah, I think yeah. it makes sense. Um, I have an answer for you. Okay. Don't focus on making money if you don't have to. Yeah. You're seventeen. Okay. You're homeschooled, so I am assuming you're not. You don't have too many bills to pay. Well, uh, I'm go I'm going to have to in three months. Okay. 
Sure. Well, yeah. moving forward in life, you're just going to be faced with more and more bills. You know, as time goes on, money is going to become a bigger obligation for you. When you're young, yeah. you're never going to have so much um, freedom as you do at this time right now. You know, your parents are supporting you. You also are probably surrounded with a bunch of other young people who are also supported by their parents. So it'd be easier for you to find collaborators uh, now because there's a lot of people with free time on their hands. Yeah, I would say that you should focus on like growing your creative work and growing that portfolio and then also growing those connections until you have to find financial stability. Sweet. All right. Yeah. You know, because when I, I was 17 and I wanted to be a filmmaker, I told like everybody, you know, I'd meet my friend's parents. They'd be like, what do you want to yeah. do when you grow up? Like, I want to make movies. 99% of them gave me the same advice. They said, well, I hope you have a backup plan because a lot of people. <laughs> oh, yeah. Them. So Which, many people have told me that, but people, I, I mean, I want it so bad. I know I'm not going to give up. I've worked so hard on it now. I, I'm, this is my, this is my plan A and I know I'll be able to, to get there. Well, the one person who gave me actual valuable advice, it actually was the best advice anybody gave me when I was 17 and wanted to be a filmmaker. Um, my friend's dad said, don't worry about making money. Only yeah. worry about making good stuff. If you make good stuff, the money will come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was his advice. And it was true. And that's, uh, that's the same advice I would give to you. Don't worry about making money. I mean, if you have to make money, if you need it, go out there and get it. But if you can just yeah, build your brand, build your artistry, you know, just hone your craft, that will be an investment in yourself that pays off so much more than, you know, crappy little unfulfilling jobs that you're doing now at 17. Yeah, that's so much more valuable than like working at a Starbucks. Yeah, man. Oh, I wish I'd get a job at Starbucks. Awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, I'm at my job right, one of my jobs right now, uh, taking out trash at a school. So, yeah, the Starbucks would be, would be sick. But I mean, yeah, I, I think that that mostly answers my, my question. I guess I'll just more focus on trying to reach out to connections now. Let me tell you exactly what you should do, okay? Okay. Because do, do you want me to tell you, I've, I've got, like, I've got, uh, three different jobs. One is working for my mother sometimes. Another one is an internship that takes up like six hours uh, two times a week. That's on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then I have trash for four hours every week now to give you a sense of how much time I'm spending working. And then how's your filmmaking going? You said you're, you're hitting that every day. What, what's that look like? Um, that is working on animations and short little film things for my Instagram and also writing every day. I, before I've, I've been writing every day for 14 days now. And just in that time of forcing myself to write every day, I've learned so much. It's insane. Um, and I, like, I actually enjoy writing now. I've watched a lot of like <laughs> Quentin Tarantino, it's, you know, Quentin Tarantino, watched a lot of his stuff, like analyzed movies. Um, and I've just been working on that in my free time. Nice. Okay, final question. Who is your collaborative partner right now? Like, who do I make stuff with right yeah. now? Uh, I, don't, I don't really have any friends locally, so I've just... I interned at Adult Swim over the summer, so I work with some of the people that I met there uh, every now and then. Nice. Somehow I knew it. Somehow I knew it. <laughs> you have to find a collaborator now. If you really want your career to take off, you need to... Uh, you need to team up with somebody who is on the okay. same path as you. Together, you guys will become way stronger than you are individually. And to be honest, that's how most people in uh, creative fields or entertainment fields, that's how they break through. They yeah. start as a group and the group gets notoriety. And then, you know, the person in the group who is the star will go on to do bigger and better things. Sometimes everybody in the group will go on to do bigger and better things. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's I mean, that's great. Thank you. That's great advice. I, I try to give whenever people on Instagram like message me and they have some sort of filmmaking question. And there's some kid that's like younger than me that wants to get into it. I always try to help them because I'm like, if I just brush it off, they could be the next big thing. But, you know, if you help somebody, then 
you know, you guys helping me now, if I, then if I get big, then of course I'm going to, you know, help you guys out in the future. Yeah. Find somebody else who makes animations that are similar to yours, something that resonates with your style and collaborate with them on something, or maybe find two or three people and do like a really big project. If a couple of you get together and do something that's really incredible, you'll probably get like, you know, if you're lucky, you'll get some notoriety, maybe even national notoriety. You'll get passed around. And then all of these doors will start to open for you. Sweet. Well, I'll start, I'll start doing more collaborations. That's something I wasn't doing a lot of. So, All right. Yeah, there man. you go. Thanks Thank for your call, J-Dog. Good Have luck. Have a wonderful night. You too. All right, everybody. We are back with JC. JC, you are talking to Derek and Meg. The Heart Slayers. What's happening? Uh, hey, Heart Slayers. I have been having this problem lately that kind of has to do with my parents. Um, my parents aren't exactly accepting of this relationship that I am currently in. They are very religious, and my girlfriend and I are not. I've been trying to get them for like together for like a dinner or something to talk, but they are pretty closed off to it and they just don't seem to like my girlfriend at all. So should I try to salvage something out of this or should I just forget it and try and move on? Oh no. Wow. What a <laughs> You've got yeah, religious that's parents horrible. and they don't approve of your relationship. Um, can I ask you uh, how old you and your girlfriend are? I am 26 and my girlfriend is 33. Okay. okay. And, and are you religious at all? Uh, no. Okay. And your parents, they don't approve of your girlfriend because she's not religious? Or is there something I else going on? Not ex I don't think it's exactly because she isn't religious, but um, we have been dating and they kind of see her come by to like pick me up or I go to hang out with her or whatever. And they just kind of come up with these wild speculations, like one of them, for example. They think she wants to take all of my money or something, or like <laughs> she's dangerous. And I try to explain that that's not the case, but I, they're just not believing me. I don't know. Have they been this way with other girlfriends in the past? Um, not really. Um, other girlfriends I've had, well, like I've brought them, like they've met them before, like. At when we were just friends and then we would start dating and they would be fine with that but okay. this is this is a girl that i've been friends with but haven't but they don't know her and they're only just they've only just been seeing her now within like the past three months or so do you do think they that they age different oh sorry derek no go ahead meg what was that oh i was just wondering if you think maybe like the age difference might have something to do with how your parents feel about her they don't know how old she is. Gotcha. Yeah. That's in the Bible. It was like you know, <laughs> hundreds of years age difference. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, sorry. I shouldn't joke around. Hey, uh, did they ever like your girlfriend or was it pretty instantaneous? The, uh, the friction there. Um... I'm not sure, like, they would see her when she came to pick me up when we would go out on, like, date nights or something, and that is really all of it. Um, she came over to watch movies with me with when we had, like, our friend group over to watch movies, and that's really all of the contact that uh, they've had with her. Okay. Have you ever just straight out asked them why they feel that way about her? Yeah, or what's going on? Not, like, directly, but they have, like, anytime I come back from, like, a date night or whatever, they, they always tell me, like, 
you should be careful with who you're hanging out with, or I don't trust that girl or whatever, uh, things like that. Huh. And you don't ask them like why they feel that way. Uh, no, I've never asked them directly. I think you should. I think you should too. And I think you don't even have to bring it up. If they're constantly saying things like this, next time they bring it up, just ask them why, why they feel that way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Because I think that would solve a lot of, you know, in theory, your parents are looking out for you. So, you know, as their child, you ask their advice, like pick their brain. Like you're telling me I'm, you know, I would say to them, I'm getting the feeling that you don't like my girlfriend or maybe you suspect something about her that I haven't picked up on. Like, is there something you think I should know about her or what do you guys like feel that I'm missing uh, from this situation? Yeah, because once they kind of give you a reason, then you could either disprove it or maybe it even opens your eyes to something that you're not currently seeing. Okay. Yeah, because last time, last time this has come up, like, uh, basically, this was with my mother. She had explained, like, oh yeah, it's just, it's just my intuition that I don't think she's, <laughs> like, I don't trust her. And then I didn't really care for that answer. <laughs> Yeah, and that's not fair to you to have them just immediately dismiss your girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think you should just sit them down and kind of sort through this because that's not fair for anybody in the situation, really. Yeah, intuition is not really a good uh, reason, (laughs) you know. Especially since they haven't, like, met her, really. Yeah. Do you have a birthday coming up? Uh, unfortunately, no. Did your birthday just pass? Uh, yeah, my birthday's in October, so it'll be a while. Oh, were you dating your girlfriend in October? Uh, early, early November, late October. Oh, okay. Because I was going to say, maybe there's an event coming up where it can all, you know, all the people who care about you could come to this event and you could force your parents and your girlfriend to spend some time together. <laughs> <laughs> What about the so do you just never bring her around to your family like holidays or anything like that? Um no, during the holidays it is more of like cuz like she has her she has her family and there's my family and they want me to be with them. Like yeah, we would go to spend time together, but I never brought her around to my family events. Okay. Well, maybe I would just try to, you know, talk to your parents, honestly, pick their brain. If they're not going to give you uh, honest answers or valid answers, maybe force them to spend some time together. That could go either way. That could make uh, your parents see something that they like in your girlfriend, or it could uh, make things worse. But I think (laughs) that by bringing them together... Basically, this is what I think is happening. There's some information that you don't have right now, JC. Your parents aren't sharing everything that they're feeling or thinking with you. Um, And I don't know if your girlfriend is even sharing with you the way she feels about your parents. Maybe she is. I don't know. But I think you need to um, drum up that information somehow. Get it to reveal itself. And I think by getting your girlfriend and your parents together in a room, that's going to lead to this inform- information being revealed to you, and then you'll be able to decide more clearly who you feel better siding with, your girlfriend or your parents. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Meg, what do you think about that? I would have said the same exact thing. Hell yeah. Well, that's a <laughs> double diagnostic from the Heart Slayers. Uh, we're doubling down on that advice. So yeah. organize a dinner or something and uh, you and your girlfriend go out with your parents. And maybe, uh, I don't know. Do you have any other family members uh, close by? <laughs> cousins, aunts, uncles? Um, There's my brother. And this exact same thing kind of happened with him, too. Oh, Has your brother made girlfriend? Uh, yes, he has. What does he think of her? Uh, he doesn't really have an opinion. He thinks, <laughs> all right, 
my brother's got a girlfriend. That's cool. But he doesn't <laughs> like. He's not like your. He's not siding with your parents or anything. No. Okay. That's a plus. That's one extra person to have on your side at this dinner. Yeah. Are you close to your brother? Uh, yeah, pretty close. Okay. Well, you know what I would do. Maybe before you introduce the girlfriend to the parents, introduce the girlfriend more to your brother. That way you can get another family member on your side to vouch for your girlfriend. And maybe that'll make your parents uh, lighten up a little bit. Hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's our advice to you, JC. I hope it helps. Uh, call back and let us know if, if you do anything about the situation. or If there's any developments, you'll please call back and let us know how it turns out, won't you? All right. I will. Thank you. Perfect. Great. All right. Thanks for the call. Good luck. All right, everybody. We are back here with Zero G. Zero G, you were talking to Derek and Meg, the Heart Slayers. What's up? Hey, guys. Not much. Um, yeah, so my question has to do with, uh, like, age gaps in dating. Um, I matched with a guy uh, on a dating app about a week ago. And uh, he's 31, and I'm 23. So it's kind of like a big gap. We actually had uh, plans for a first date. We chatted for a while, had plans for a first date, and actually kind of fell through because I got sick and then kind of fizzled out. But after, you know, telling my friends about it, you know, I'm about to go on a date because I don't date much, some people were a little weirded out, you know, with the with the age gap and being 31. I'm 23 and almost done with college, but I'm still in college. So I, I was just curious uh, on what you guys thought on sort of age gap in dating when it's too much or if it is or anything like okay. that. Meg, are you laughing? No. Meg, are you <laughs> laughing at this guy's situation? Of course God, not. I can't believe you do that. I 20, would never. 23 to 31. I thought I heard something. No, I was not laughing. I promise. 23 to 31. Um, is, that, is that eight years? Yeah, it's, it is. That's nothing at all, man. Yeah, that like is. once you, honestly, once you hit a certain age, like, I hate to say it, but age doesn't matter. Um, full disclosure moment. That's the same age gap between me and my girlfriend. <laughs> yep. Oh, okay. Eight years. And the person we were just talking to, the call before you, they were in a relationship where the person was seven years older than them. And th that wasn't even the issue with their call. Um, yeah. yeah. I think, like, as long as the two people are mature about the relationship, it really doesn't matter what the age gap is. Let me do the quick mental internet rule what is it half your age plus uh, seven yeah something like that <laughs> have yeah. you done the math oh uh, i haven't done that It'd but 15 yeah 15 and no. a half plus seven years is 22 and a half 22 yeah, yeah dude yeah. you're in you're 23 <laughs> you're six months over the, the barometer you you're clear <laughs> yeah, that's true i don't know if that's a if that's a is standard measurement but that's always my go-to i heard that once it seemed like it made sense yeah it um, does i I wasn't too worried about it. It's just kind of, I, I think it might be more of like, I'm still, I haven't quite graduated college yet. A lot of my friends are still in college. And I think maybe that kind of played into some of my friends' mentality towards it is like, you know, still kind of college kids, not really, but you know, like kind of on that border. And then someone who's like 31, as far as where they are in their lives, you know, it's typically yeah. they're a little bit quite, you know, quite a little bit farther along, maybe have their their career almost set in place, that type of thing. So I don't know. Yeah. You know what? I'll be honest. Some people do. Some people don't. No, exactly. When, like when some people have their uh, shit together when they hit 30 and a lot of people don't. Yeah. No. Zero G, you are coming towards the end of a roller coaster. Uh, you know, college, the year, the ages of like 18 to 22, sometimes 23, 24. Those are very uh, formative years. You may agree, probably at each age between 18 and 22, you were four or five completely different people. I oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. A lot of people relate to that. Moving on, you know, 24, 25, 26, you're going to start solidifying the type of person you are. Uh, and then going into your early 30s, you're not going to change much from how you were in your mid-20s. You're, yeah. you're going you're gonna to still change and develop, but it's going to be a more subtle change. Um, so that is to say, a few years ago, obviously, you wouldn't be dating somebody in their 30s. You may not even be dating somebody in their late 20s when you're in your early 20s, but you are approaching your mid-20s. And so I think somebody in their early 30s is not 
too old for you. Um, if you guys get along, if you guys have stuff in common, if you feel like, you know, mentally you are equal, that's all that really matters. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's a show that I watched called Age Gap Love. I think it's like... Oh, my God. What? <laughs> my mom watches that show. Yeah, okay. It's, it's a popular <laughs> show. Dude, the age gaps on that show, they start at 20 years. Anything over oh, yeah. 20 years is not considered age gap for age gap love. Not, not even good enough. Doesn't make yeah. the cut. Some people have like a 40-year <laughs> difference, and they're happy. And if the people in the relationship are happy... What does it matter? Uh, exactly. You know, what the yeah. friends think. They'll get over it. Yeah, I, there wasn't anyone like telling me not to, you know, not to date him or, you know, like talk to him or anything. It, it was just kind of some confused faces or kind of comments of like, hey, you know, are you really sure? You know, it might be a little too old, you know, so I, more of a general concern. Like I said, I, it didn't really work out with him anyway, but, you know, just going forward, I just would like to get you guys' opinion. So that's why I was asking. You are all good. The Heart Slayers oh, yeah. give you the stamp of approval. I actually don't even consider you in an age gap relationship. Nah. Appreciate it. Yep. So there you go, Zero G. Happy to help out. All right, everybody. We are here with Ben. Ben, you're talking to Derek and Meg, the Heart Slayers. What's up? So I just got back from a visit with my boyfriend. I visited him in Canada um, for like a week and a half. And I'm California. I live in Long Beach. So uh, it was super cold and everything. But anyway, um, we've been dating for like three years approximately now. And um, before I was with him, I had a really bad relationship that lasted like a year and a half. And it was my first real relationship. I was like 16. And the guy I was with was 21. So it really fucked me up. And I have a lot of, like, baggage from that. And it's carried over into my current relationship. And my boyfriend is super understanding and he's really patient and everything. But I'm worried that, like, my ability to show affection is damaged. And I'm not sure how to fix that. Do you guys have advice for me? I feel like we're about the same person right now. <laughs> really? Oh, that makes me happy. <laughs> Sorry, Derek. <laughs> Meg, lead the conversation. Go for it. All right. Well, <laughs> so I'm also in a long distance relationship currently, and it's my first like real relationship after having a super long term relationship that ended really, really badly. Oh. And Honestly, the baggage, the more that you work on yourself and the more that you try to just kind of move past that, the baggage goes away. And I wouldn't, honestly, I didn't personally take this route, but I've had friends who have. I wouldn't rule out going to therapy because 16 to 21, like, if he, if you say that he fucked you up, like, that's something that you might have to talk to somebody about because that's heavy. It's a lot of shit to deal with. Yeah. And it's okay to talk to friends and stuff, but sometimes I do think that talking to like a professional helps you work through things. So I think honestly, just it's something that you need to kind of take care of yourself. And it's great that your boyfriend is understanding because I also had a problem with affection with my current boyfriend, but now like He's the type of person that I don't have a problem showing affection to. So I think it's just something that you need to mentally work through for yourself. Yeah, that's that's kind of the, the idea that I've gotten. And therapy is something that I've actually really strongly considered is just a matter of like, where do I go? And like, how much is it going to cost? Because my insurance is weird and all that kind of stuff. But like... Yeah, I thought I was over it until I got into this relationship and started realizing, like, oh, I'm uncomfortable way more than I should be. Yeah, reason. therapy will absolutely help you with that. And there's a lot of resources online if you just kind of, like, Google that and then also Google your health insurance. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't want to pry too much into your personal life, Ben. No, but go is for it. it 
like a trust thing with your new boyfriend? Is it like, um, I mean. It's not trust so much as like, um, I'm not going to get into like the gritty details or anything, but this is Fine. this relationship that was my first relationship was like my first um, like intimate encounter with anybody like yeah uh it was also a long distance relationship and so then when i met him for the first time um it was really uncomfortable and like we did sexual stuff that felt really like forced onto me and i just after that being my first experience stuff like that afterwards just feels really uncomfortable and i have a hard time like speaking up if I am comfortable because of that experience. And I've gotten better with it with time. Like, obviously, I'll say if I don't want to do something, I'll say so. But um, okay. yeah. it's just a you matter of, like, feeling uncomfortable when I know I shouldn't have to. Right. Totally. Thank you for sharing that. Because uh, yeah. that was, you know, that's personal stuff. You know, what I think is that most people's first relationships are fucked up. It's true, though. <laughs> Most people's first relationships are fucked up. So the first thing I'm going to tell you, Ben, is you're not alone. Most people start dating when they're in their teens. Some people are in their early teens. My first girlfriend, I was in my late teens, but I was still a teenager, and I didn't know what a relationship was supposed to be like. Yeah. You know, my, my basis of a relationship was, uh, like, movies and stupid stuff but i wasn't like surrounding myself with people who were in happy healthy relationships teenagers are really fucked up to each other even somebody who's 21 is not technically a teenager um but they're dating a teenager so i would say mentally they might mentally, be still yeah. a teenager oh yeah like, oh yeah this guy oh yeah <laughs> not like a nurturing and compassionate person so i think a lot of people it's sad because your first relationship, you've heard the term, the first cut is the deepest. Your first relationship is the one that's going to affect you the most of all the relationships you have for the rest of your life, probably until you meet somebody that you're going to marry. So I too, you know, had a, my own problems in my first relationship that fucked me up moving forward into later relationships. And I did find myself holding this new person accountable for the things the old person had done. And it, it ruined a couple of my, uh, you know, early relationships until I realized that I was being unfair to these new people. Um, you know, I'm not saying you need to force yourself to change or do anything. All I'm saying is you need to realize that it's very common for first relationships to really mess with people's heads and a lot of people have to figure out what ex first of all they have to figure out what exactly was unhealthy about that first relationship and that's not easy to do all the time and then they need to figure out how to recognize what is that situation again and what is not that situation again and that too is not that easy to do um so, right. Yeah, and I'm with Meg. I would encourage you to, you know, talk to somebody about it. Maybe a close friend, a therapist if you need to, but And what I did also was I just I talked to my boyfriend to explain the reason why I was acting or doing the things that I was doing oh, and yeah. Yeah. that also helps a lot because it gives them an understanding like, oh, it's not them, it's something that happened in their past. So he's helped me work through things as well. So it sounds like your boyfriend is also another good resource for that. Yeah, yeah. I've talked to him extensively about it and he understands where I'm coming from. Because, I mean, that first relationship ended in like 2014. So it's been mm -hmm. a while since it's then. It's been a while. That's good. Um, and Ben, you should remember too, you're not the same person you were when you were 16. Exactly. Okay. I'm sure okay. sometimes, you know, when you have these feelings, it makes you feel like, oh, I'm still that person. You're not that person. The fact that these alarms are going off in your head, that's the thing that was missing from the 16-year-old version of you. So all of these feelings, even though they kind of feel sucky and negative, these are the things that are going to cause you to grow. They're actually, you know, in a way, valuable. I'm not going to say they're good, but they do have a value in a certain sense. So Right. You have to recognize the growth you've already done, Ben, and don't get down on yourself. Stay strong. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, you got this. Thanks.
Thank you guys. That actually helped a lot. I never really considered um can like I don't know. I can't articulate my thoughts. But thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. We really appreciate your call. Thank you for sharing it with us. And you know, honestly, good luck. Thank Hope you so out. much. That means a lot. Okay, everybody, that wraps up this episode of Heart Slayers. Thank you for joining us. As always, I am Derek Acosta with my host, Meg Turner. The invisible Meg Turner. <laughs> you may not be able to see her right now, but you can read her insightful intellectual thoughts on Twitter. You want to True. plug them with your handle? Yeah, it's at Furnace Woods. That's right. I am at Gustavo, but you can also follow this show at Heart Slayers on Twitter. Don't forget, you could, if you were yeah, signed also, up to the Mega64 Patreon for just $1, you could see all of these episodes one week early. And if you were watching on YouTube and you have your own take on any of the issues we covered today, go ahead and leave them in the comments. I always read the comments. Sometimes I learn something. Not often, but there are some <laughs> many heart slayers out there who are pretty good with their own take, with their own advice on these issues. So feel free to lend us your thoughts. Uh, and join will, our Discord. <laughs> join our Discord. Find Heart Slayers on Discord. We will be back every Tuesday at 4 p.m. So we'll see you guys again in... Uh... Yeah. Bye-bye. Later. Later.